your hand, you are ready to go. Now the first part of speaking, like I said before, in that huge iceberg, is all the preparation that we just did. But now we need to start our preparation for the delivery aspect. And our physical delivery is essential to communicating our message. We can write the most dynamic, wonderful, fantastic speech in the whole universe. But if it is not delivered effectively through our physicality, that wonderful, well-written speech can fall on ears that don't hear it. It can never be motivating. It could never be received in the correct way. Some people almost, some people will oftentimes also deem it as not effective or boring or uninteresting when it may in fact on paper be dynamic and super interesting. It is up to you to bring those words to life. And there are specific things that we will continue to work on over the semester in order to develop the characteristics and traits of your delivery. Now the important thing to always remember is that I don't expect everybody to come out with enthusiasm the same way that I do. I am incredibly expressive and I use my hands and I use my voice and I um, have a, a loud and large personality when it comes to public speaking. I know that not everybody is like that, but enthusiasm looks different to everybody. Can you show me that you are at least interested to be up there and speaking to us? And what does that look like? Because this does not look interested to be standing up and speaking to us. I don't want you to have to fake smile either, but at least put on some parts of our body and disposition that communicate being interested in your audience. Because when you stand up there and look, it has our audience oftentimes feeling like, did we do something wrong? Are you irritated with us? I'm sorry, do you have to be here for us today? And that isn't what we ever want our audience to feel. Your audience will believe what they see rather than what they hear. And that's because nonverbal communication is what people default on. It is a universal language because facial expressions, for example, are universal. Everybody has the same types of facial expressions, sad, angry, happy, right? We know how to read those. So when we see people's faces, we can typically understand what the meaning behind the words are. So it's very important that we get those two things matched up and we also start to use our body and our voice in a way that encourages and enhances our message rather than distracts from it. Because if you've ever been in a public speaking situation where somebody has a non-verbal distraction, you get fully taken out of the message itself. So there are a couple elements that we're going to go over for this speech in particular. And the first thing that I want you to know is this idea of movement. In this speech, you can do one of two things. And I'm going to, hold on one second, I'm going to grab You are more than welcome to use the podium. The podium is what we see in formal speech settings where we oftentimes think of people having to use a podium. And a podium is fine, but the podium also can become a huge crutch for individuals to not only hide behind, but also it becomes a place for us to hold our bodies so tightly that we never end up engaging with the audience any other way. Or it can become a place of, what am I communicating? Uh, maybe laziness, right? So you are more than welcome to use the podium. And we'll talk about how to use that effectively in one second. But what you can also do is something what's called the speaker's pyramid. And you can keep the same idea in mind for the entire semester. And I encourage you at least one time to try utilizing the speaker's pyramid method. 
trying to move this. So I'm going to simply draw you out. The speaker's pyramid is a standard in public discourse because oftentimes people will think, well, where am I going? What am I moving? And people like to walk around. But when people are walking around like this in their speech and walking back and forth, what does it make you feel? It can sometimes make you feel anxious, it can make you feel energized, and people do walk back and forth in speeches oftentimes. Who walks back and forth when they're like pumping up an audience or perchance an evangelical preacher or somebody who's telling you to go out there and win the big game? Those people are moving back and forth because their bodies want to stir up that kind of energy in you. Unless we're doing a motivational speech, I don't find it to be necessary to move back and forth. And instead, let's move with intention and purpose. So where does your speech move? That's right, on the transition. It moves you from point to point. So the speaker's pyramid works in that exact perfect way. It encourages you to move on your transition. So if you see my little circles here, this at the top is you. And this is where you are for your introduction and your conclusion. And then this is your first main point, your second main point, and your third main point. So if you picture the room like a triangle, this is how we're going to move. I would start my presentation here, and I would move to my subsequent places when I moved to that main point. So these lines are, in essence, your transition. Since each of you, for the duration of the semester, will be utilizing speaker's notes, I want to remind you that I encouraged you to use one piece of paper, front and back, and that's actually what you're allowed to use. But if we keep a paper out in front of us like this and hold it, it can not only become a bit distracting because it's large, but if we have some kind of nerves inside us, our body will oftentimes shake as well. I encourage you to fold your paper in half and use it like so. This is how you could use your paper when walking. Now, if I was going to be doing my speaker's pyramid, it would look something like this. So I'll give my introduction here, so I'll, I'll start with the thesis. Today, for all of you to get to know me better, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my hobbies, my job, and some things I like to do on the weekend. First, let's start out by looking at my job in hopes that you can get to know me a bit better. Now that I told you a little bit about my job, I'd next like to tell you about my hobbies so that you can get to know me better. And then, don't worry, I'm going to finish it out over here. Lastly, let me tell you about, I forgot what my last thing was, but whatever that last thing was so you can get to know me better. Today we talked a little bit about my job, my hobbies, my family, all in hopes that you got to know me better. And so in this way, we have simply moved. We've worked the entire audience. It helps us to feel a little bit more at ease. It also engages the audience more when you're not simply standing. It keeps them moving as well. If you decide that you want to use the speaker's pyramid, I am so excited. Practice, however, with your speaker's outline and practice it whilst walking. The same thing if you were going to be using a podium. Try to find something as similar to a podium as possible when you practice. Or, like, stack up a bunch of books and, and work on that. But if you are going to be using the podium, note that the podium's purpose is for you to put a piece of paper on. That's what it's there for. It is not there for you to lean on or do anything else. I encourage each of you to put your paper as close to the top here as you can, and if you feel comfortable enough, even take a step back away from it. However, if you are in need to touch the podium or you're having a lot of the nerves and you feel like you need to squeeze something to get that energy out, I encourage you to keep your hands down at the bottom or your hands down here. Do not put your hands at the top. It will make you feel like you can lean on it. But if you have your hands down here and you lean, oh, that's uncomfortable. So it will stop you from doing so. Hopefully that makes sense in regards to the podium. But while we're talking about movement, let's talk about the body and posture. We want to communicate confidence in our ideas. 
And whether that confidence comes from us maintaining credibility with the audience, that we know what we're talking about, or promotes that we believe in the knowledge that we have, what does a confident body look like? A confidence is communicated in this culture as having our shoulders back and our head up. So if we can hold our body and our posture up, oftentimes I can communicate the idea that I'm super confident and I know what I'm talking about, even when I'm not and I don't feel very good about myself. So this image that we can project is also important to our audience. However, I'm going to encourage us to continue to think about our posture throughout the course of our semester. Not all speeches are always neutral or positive or uplifting or upbeat or exciting. Many of them will have a serious tone that goes along with it. Or perchance we're going to have a, a, a difficult or challenging topic to talk about. Or maybe there is something incredibly discouraging and heartfelt and sad. In that case, I want you to consider what that looks like. If I'm telling you a sad story, I may not want to stand like so. And instead, when we're sad, sometimes our body starts to slump over. So even in so, you can take your posture and you can simply turn in your shoulders a little bit or lean in when you're talking about that sad story, right? And so again, it's not necessarily acting, but like think of what your natural body would do. And if you need to lean in, or if you were telling a secret, feel free to get closer to the audience. Or if we're thinking that we need to say something super important, we can get out there and say, hey, this part's the most important. This is the big deal. So feel free to explore that different type of posture. But for right now, really try to encourage yourself to hold your body, to hold your shoulders square, to hold your head up. Building upon that, that brings us to this idea of eye contact. Eye contact is not always an easy thing for individuals to do, to think and to engage uh, individuals throughout the audience. If this isn't something that you are completely comfortable with, there are some tricks for you. But let me say that scrolling the audience and making eye contact with different individuals is our best way to ensure that we are connecting with our audience, to keep them engaged, to let them know that we are thinking of them. Because in actuality, eye contact can build your credibility culturally, again, our specific culture here in the United States at the Santa Monica College in a speech class, that culturally this eye contact is showing a sign of respect. If you ever got in trouble with your parents when you were younger they're fur and you didn't look at them, I'm quite sure the words were, look at me when I'm talking to you. Not only do they want you to know that you're paying attention, but also it's a sign of engagement. So eye contact is a great way, especially if you're doing a persuasive speech, and you're like, I really care about you and hope that this works for you. It's nice to say that to somebody's eyes rather than like, man, I really care about you and I hope this works. I buy this first one much, much more. So make sure that we are trying to engage the entire audience. Don't look at the ceiling, because right now I know we're looking at the ceiling. Don't look at the back wall. We know when you're looking at the back wall. And at the floor, we know when you're looking at the floor. Sadly, we are very, aware of what you are doing. So it is important for us to start practicing this skill. And if you can't practice this skill, well, there are tricks. And what's the trick? Well, you take one or two ideas, aka one or two sentences, and you deliver it to the first person. And then you take the next idea and you deliver it to the next person. And then you take the next idea and you deliver it to the next person. But there's oftentimes individuals in the audience who will continue to give you positive feedback and nod their head and smile, I'll be one of them. And these are the individuals that you can go and connect with that can build your confidence in looking out at other individuals as well. I encourage each of us to give our audience or our fellow classmates that positive reinforcement. Maybe give them some nonverbal feedback, like, oh, I'm getting what you're talking about, or <laughs> that is funny. It helps them to work on the feedback. If you don't get something, feel free to give a confused face, right? That will let them know that people don't understand. We can't assume that they can read minds either. So eye contact is incredibly important. 
The place where we also will lose eye contact is during our, when we look down at our notes. But that can become very brief and very easy. So like I said, having those key words and phrases and having that handout rather than having the whole thing in front of you will prevent you from reading and not engaging with your audience. The next thing is your facial expressions. Ah! Now I don't expect you to be expressive. And I don't, again, want you to do fake smile or, oh, now you're sad to go. But instead, try when you're talking to us, utilizing your personality to show some kind of interest or expression in what you are speaking about. So even if that means moving your eyebrows up or giving a smile every now and again or being confused when you show confusion. And I know that some of these things may not seem natural, but once you get into the storytelling and the development of your speech when it's in your body, you will very much so start to express or exude those specific traits. The one thing we just don't want is deer in headlights because that doesn't tell us anything, it's not helping us to communicate, and it's also not keeping us interested. So try to give us something in your face, and even if you don't have anything written in your speech, try to write in a story or a detail or a description that emodes, that, oh sorry, that exudes some kind of emotion. When you can choose one of those stories, at least you know in that part, you can give some type of expressive quality, and that will be enough. Now moving down our body, we start to think about our hands as well. What do you do with your hands? People always get confused as to what to do with their hands. Hands can become a huge distraction. If you have full use of your arms and your hands, I encourage you to use them as they are an expression of what you're talking about. Now you don't want to just be doing your hands to be doing your hands because then the hands become what? A huge distraction all on their own. We want to keep our hand movements simple, but also we want to utilize them. Because somebody who just sits there the whole time and doesn't use their hands is not assisting in our audience continuing to be, in, in, uh, be engaged. And we'll talk a little bit about that when it comes to listening as well. But I want to encourage you all to try to use your hands. Even if you have the podium, even if you have the paper, we have one paper and it's okay to move the paper around a little bit. Like now that I told you about, let's next tell you about, and here, here we go and we have this other hand that we can use. In regards to the podium, it's fine. You can use your hands from here as well. But there are places where you can put in hand gestures if you don't feel comfortable at all times. I encourage you to write this in your notes, as uh, in your speaker's notes. You can write some of these delivery cues if you want to remind yourself. Smile, bang on podium, throw up hand of anger, whatever. But you will be required to do signposts, and you will have two to three main points. So you can always use your hands to enumerate when you're talking about those things and put it back down. At least it's something you engage the audience. You can also use it to show sizing, like it was this tall, she was this wide, it was this tiny, or you can do it to make an impact. So you can say something like, this is important. Oh my goodness, could you believe it? I was shocked. I was so hungry. We walked for hours and our body was drained. However you can use it to like, communicate that exclamation would be an excellent way to use your hands for this first speech and at least get using them. So we've talked about our face, and we've talked about our eyes, and we've talked about our hands, and we've talked about the movement. But the last thing is what's happening below the podium. And if we're using the podium, we still have that space under the desk where people can see us. We want to make sure that we are maintaining the structure here. So I encourage you that we want to avoid things like leaning or crossing our legs because it can make us slouch on top. So instead, try to keep that up posture, well, that upright posture. Sorry, y'all. I'm just seeing how that looks. Try to keep that upright posture by doing so and keeping, oh good, there you can see it. So yeah, so our legs either a little bit together and like keep them grounded or you can keep one beveled or you can keep them both together. We want to make sure that we bend them though and we keep our, our, um, our blood circulating. 
The pickle here is that people will oftentimes want to move at the podium and they'll continue to shift their weight when it doesn't really have any purpose. Again, when we move, we move with purpose. So if you're just going to be shifting weight back and forth, that's going to become a huge distraction. The other thing is that, oh sorry, for our hands, that's what I wanted to remind us all of. We want to make sure that our Sometimes we need to get nervous energy out. I know that personally for myself, if I ever do a public speaking formal environment, I put my hair all up. Why? Because I like to fidget and flip my hair. If you fidget and flip your hair, put your hair out of your face. Now it has taken away the distraction to do this the whole time. If you have jewelry, people will oftentimes play with their jewelry. Or if you have a sweatshirt with pockets, people will oftentimes put their sweatshirt pockets in and do something else. We'll keep their hands behind their back the whole time. Or we'll keep their hands like this, which also is very closed off and doesn't communicate much. I also sometimes will play with my ring in formal settings when I'm thinking about what I want to say. So I will always remove my ring and any other jewelry that I have in order to avoid distraction. I never will keep a pen with me during formal speaking either, because people will click their pen or pull the pen apart or do whatever. So try not, and when I say try not to, don't, bring anything else up with you than your body. And make it as easy of a palette as possible. So when I say that as well, let's make it in regards to our appearance. You do not need to dress professionally in this class, but what I ask is that you do come in looking like you didn't roll out of bed and that you are going to deliver a speech and that you are showing up for your audience. Also, do not wear any shirts with logos on them on speech days. It detracts from your message. And especially if you have a logo that says something much different than what is coming out of your mouth, that can be very contradictory. But even if you have a logo with a simple smiley face on it, people will stare at that smiley face the whole time rather than listening to what you're saying. So don't give them an opportunity to do so. The other thing is hats. We don't wear hats in or during speeches, even fashion hats, because it blocks one's eyes. So please make sure that you're not wearing a hat or taking it off for the speech itself. So we talked about appearance, hands, body, movement, posture, face, the last thing is to talk a little bit about our voice. And we're going to work on vocal variety throughout our class. But what I want to pay special note of this time are things we call vocalized pauses. Individuals naturally speak with vocalized pauses. It is part of our slang, it's part of what we do, it's part of like hanging out with our friends. Maybe it's because you grew up in the valley and you have a light problem, as I did for so many years. There are these vocalized pauses that do not assist in our message getting across. And the vocalized pauses that I'm talking about are things like, right here, we are going to avoid these words, um, uh, yeah, no, Right, so, and, and, just, or kind of, and the word guys. On the other hand, there's something called articulation. People will oftentimes think that articulate people, oh, they're smart, they use these big words. No. Articulate means simply that you are utilizing the word in the way it should be said. How is the movement of your voice? So often we will say the words, today I'm gonna talk to you about. No, you're not gonna talk to me about anything. You're going to. And that's what said makes somebody sound articulate. It truly has very little to do with the content. It has to do with when we use things like gonna, wanna, have to, mm -mm, going to, want to, have to. That is the way that we are going to say it. And if you have something in this first part of your speech 
where you may use going to. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am, right? Make sure that you are practicing implementing that type of articulation. Um and uh are fillers that don't have any meaning at all except, except for two things, except communicating. If you hear somebody say, um, 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 it's a way for us to think about what we are saying. But to the audience, it perchance can communicate that we don't know what we're talking about. And although it may be okay in everyday conversation, if it does happen, repetitively, and people are using ums and uhs over and over and over and over again in their presentations, it can very easily take away from what the message actually is. So we want to try and take out those ums and uhs, and instead replace it with the breath. And I can tell you where your ums and uhs will come from. They are at every punctuation mark that you make. When we switch ideas, whether that be a comma or at the end of our sentence, and we look down and we try to regauge ourselves, that's what people will say, um. And I want to encourage you now that if you are going to be coming to the end of your sentence, for example, to start practicing taking a breath and then looking back up at the audience. When you look down, oh man, it's just breathing. When I look down, um, ooh, Amanda doesn't know what she's talking about. We can control that through practice. Now, are three, four, five ums in a speech horrible? No, it's normal. Are 25, 15, 10 ums in a speech horrible? They're not horrible, it's simply distracting. So if that happens to be something that you have, we will work on that throughout the semester and we will make note of it. But if you start practicing in advance, and this is one of those things that I was telling you, practice in front of another person. Every time you say um or uh or any of these other words behind you, have that person raise their hand and that means that you have to start your speech over. When you have to start over for the 15th time, I can guarantee you, you will not say um, because you will simply think before you speak. And although it is hard at times to think about what we're going to talk about before we're going to talk about it, you know where you're going. And with the practice of speaking, you will get into a habit of taking those pauses, thinking about your next idea, and then going forward. People will think that pausing is so long, and it's so damaging, and it's so harmful. We hardly, if ever, notice it as audience members when individuals take a mindful pause. It's also kind to your audience. They get to catch up, remind themselves what you were talking about. It also lets us know that an idea is ending, so that is super helpful. You know is something that people will put on the end of a sentence, as well as write. I oftentimes will say, does that make sense? After too many sentences in class, I notice it because it's simply a follow-up to making myself feel more comfortable. But it doesn't have any type of purpose. When we say, you know, yeah, I know, because you simply just told me. Or, no, I don't know, so use some words to describe it instead. But be confident in the statement and end it there. The same with right. You don't need to say right. You believe it, and if you are communicating that belief and that assertion, we too will. So watch out for those words in your own way. So and and are problematic when they are used in lieu of punctuation or to start a sentence. I have a huge problem with starting my sentences with so. I will always practice eliminating those from my professional presentations because we never want to start with the so. I've had speeches where you're like, is this an entire paragraph? There's not one piece of punctuation. No, it's like so, so, so in between each sentence. And that doesn't allow for the audience to re-gauge, reconnect, and it becomes a distraction. And, 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 watch out for those. Just and kinda are 
are both words that individuals will use when they are describing things about themselves or when they're trying to describe feelings. I notice it the most in students when they try to describe feelings because just and kind of don't make them as solid. And then you don't appear as vulnerable or as people will sometimes think, oh, well, I don't want to talk about all my accolades because it makes me seem cocky. No, you're simply telling us what you've done. Up until this point, I think you've done a lot of good things. Talk about it. And when we put the word just in front of something, it demeans whatever we were talking about. I spoke a little bit about this earlier in one of the classes, and I said something like, well, I'm just a server. I'm just a teacher. I mean, I'm just a mom. No, oh, I'm a mom. I'm a server. I'm a teacher. I'm just going to school right now. You're going to school right now? That's amazing. When we start to put the just is when we create the negative disposition around it. When we, when we start to create the reality for the rest of the world that that isn't enough. Your use of the word just is contributing to that ideology, whereby, by eliminating it, we can assist in helping other people see that I'm a server, I'm a teacher, I won three awards. If you like something, oh, I kind of think that it's like this, it's kind of an emotional time, it's kind of a probably a thing. It's not kind of probably anything, because it's kind of, it's probably, those are two different things. Be concrete in your words and in your emotions. Simply state them for what they are and practice writing them in that way, how you would say that concretely. And the last thing is the word guys. You will, it is a slang in our culture. It is a slang terminology. We are going to eliminate it from our vocabulary. There are men and women in our classroom. And by saying the word guys, it is incredibly limiting. It's also a sense of slang. It's not inclusive. And it has very harmful effects that we can always talk about later on in the semester. There also is, if you do say the word guys, don't add on girls to it to try to be inclusive. Because now that's only a dichotomy. There are individuals who exist all along that spectrum. And also, I don't think there are any girls in this class because we're all probably over the age of 18. So then you would be like, guys and women, that doesn't make any sense. We can say something like, today I am here to tell you. Done, you. Guys, no, I'm here to tell you. Easy enough. So consider those words as y'all go forward. Okay, everybody, so that is about it. This lasted a little bit longer than that 20 minutes that I promised, but I am available to all of you over the course of the next couple days if you would like to give me an email or if you would like to send me a message. If you have any of the questions, you can always put those up on our discussion board on Canvas as well, that general discussion board for questions. And then I want to encourage you, remember that when you come into class on Tuesday, you're going to come in, you'll sign up on the board in the order that you want to go. Then you will take your evaluation sheet, you'll put your name on it, you'll put your number, you'll put it on the desk. You'll take your speaker's notes, you'll put your name, your number, and you'll put it on the desk in numerical order. And then we'll get ready and get going. Practice five times out loud with another person if you can and think great thoughts about yourself. You can do this. I will be stopping you periodically throughout this speech to make corrections if there's something that's going awry. Do not worry. If I stop you, can you still get an A? Yes. But I want you to work on these skills now and practice before we get to a point way later in the semester and they're embedded in you. Let's start off practicing these good skills that you can employ every day as you go forward. Have a great weekend.